Our next speaker, Brother Charles Pogue, is a native of Liberty Hill, Texas. He began preaching while still in high school. And he's a 1995 graduate of Memphis School of Preaching. He's done local work in Texas, Arkansas, and now Missouri. In addition to the located work, he's preached by appointment, held meetings in several other states. He's also spoken in a number of lectureships. He's written extensively over the years. His writing includes articles, tracts, and a number of books. He was formerly publisher and editor of the Issues of Life. He now writes a series of weekly articles called Sobering Sounds. He and his wife, Linda, help with the church in Burnett, Texas, to produce the weekly bulletin. They also own the website in wordordeed.com. Charles and Linda have two grown children, a son and a daughter. They also have six grandchildren. And we're very pleased to have Brother Poe come speak to us. His wife spoke to the ladies this week, and we look forward to hearing the message she has to bring to us. Brother Poe. As others have said, I am indeed grateful to the elders of this great spring congregation for the invitation to be a part of this lectureship. And I thank Brother Brown for his superb job of always directing uh, this lectureship and I love him for the great work that he has done through the years. Your stand for the truth is known far and wide of those of like mind. I would also be remiss if I failed to thank this congregation as well as others who are in this audience for your assistance and your prayers last December when our son and his family suffered the fire at their home. Your prayers, your words of encouragement, and the monetary assistance that you sent them was so very, very helpful. And, and we think that uh, brethren are much better at coming to one another's aid than perhaps some of the men that wrote some of these books might believe. So we appreciate very much your love and your concern. As I have sat here for the last three days and listened to the reviews of these books, I could not help but think that an old saying I learned some 40 plus years ago applies to these writers. He who thinks by the inch and talks by the mile should be kicked by the foot. <laughs> Richard T. Hughes has taught at Abilene Christian University, at Pepperdine University. He joined the faculty of Messiah College in Grantham, Pennsylvania in 2006. And he has co-written other books that will be reviewed in this lectureship. A couple of days before we headed to Paradise, I happened to run across an article that was written by Richard T. Hughes, and you would probably never guess where it was posted. It was on the Huffington Post. And in this article, and I won't go over much of 
what he says there, but I will let you know that if you want to read this, you can. If you don't want to, I don't blame you. But he is just flabbergasted that 75% of this nation's population who claims to follow Jesus would oppose a government program to help the poor. I am not at all convinced that the government program of Obamacare that he's talking about does the poor any good, but rather would do them more harm. But that's not really my point. My point is that this kind of association shows the type of men that we're dealing with. They're not just liberals in the church. They are men who are way out in left field. They are men who perhaps would mix with the Jeremiah rights of this world more so than they would even with the denominations that they sometimes tend to defend. They are as much concerned with social justice as they are true. So that's the kind of man that we're dealing with in terms of the author of The Churches of Christ. This book is a little bit different from the others that have been reviewed to this point in that it uh, purports to be a history it is the first time, and I will have to admit this to you, that I have ever reviewed a book. And so it has been a learning process for me. And when you read the manuscript or whatever, you may say, yes, it is a learning process for you. The copy that I have of this book is the student's edition. It was published in 2001 by the Prager Publishers, which is an imprint of Greenwood Publishing Group. And it is one of a series of denominational studies. Now what is interesting to me is that Prager <coughs> focuses a lot on social sciences. And as a matter of fact, if I were to state in one sentence my overall assessment of this book is that it is evolution applied to religion. In the Bible, we read Jesus saying, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. On the back cover of this book, we read this. The story of the Churches of Christ, one of three major denominations which emerged as a result of a religious movement on the American frontier that was led by Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone in the early 19th century. The book of Acts says, after Jesus arose from the grave, he spent some 40 days with his apostles. Acts 1, 3, then just a few days following his ascension on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached by the apostles and the church was established. Now, brethren, it did not evolve, but rather they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship of the breaking of bread and in prayer. The book of Hughes says, the Churches of Christ began a slow evolution in the 1930s from a sect to a denomination. The New Testament says the church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, a passage that has been referred to numerous times already. The book of Hughes says that the Churches of Christ began as a promising movement that burst upon the American scene in the early 19th century. 
the New Testament says, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. I could not begin to count. Well, let me take that back. I did begin to count, but the times were so many that I threw up my hands in despair and quit trying to count. The number of times Richard Hughes refers to the churches of Christ as this tradition. No, this is not a tradition, brethren, and you know that as well as I. This is the church that our Lord shed his blood and died for on the cross. At Calvary. I did manage to count the usages of this tradition in the shortest chapter of the book. That would be chapter 18 or, or chapter uh, on renewal. And there were 18 times in less than eight pages that he used this phrase, this tradition, and it appears over and over and over again throughout the book. So in cooperation with the Prager series of denominational studies, rather than agreement with our Lord, Hughes asserts that the churches of Christ became the fourth largest denomination in the United States. I suppose it is really a small thing that I or any other man would take offense with Hughes' assertion that the Church of Christ is a denomination among denominations. It is, however, a very great thing with eternal consequences that God does. I have never personally quite understood how it can be that a man, any man, can assert that the New Testament church the blood-bought institution purchased by the blood of our loving Savior does not exist. That all that there is is this denominational body or that denominational body. And I would affirm in your hearing this morning that if I went to bed at night and that's what I believed, I would not be able to sleep. I would toss. And I would turn. I would live my life in fear of eternal consequences. Because our Lord died to save his body. He did not die to save anything else. He did not die. And he did not promise to save any denomination. Now Hughes informs us on page 43 of his book that those who believe the church originated in Jerusalem as a result of the apostles' teaching who were articulating the mind of God and that that church had remained uncorrupted by the influences of culture and tradition are historically naive. Tolbert Fanning was one of those who was naive, according to Richard Hughes, when Tolbert Fanning preached that other churches originated in the course of particular historical times and as a result of the German Reformation, but the Church of Christ originated in Jerusalem, that was a naive thing to preach. And as I read that, I couldn't help but wonder if Hughes believes those who hold the first part of that description, that the church originated in Jerusalem as a result of the apostles' teaching, who were articulating the mind of God, were the apostles naive? Were they really articulating the mind of God? Or were they deceived as well? Unfortunately for him, I'm afraid that he does indeed believe that. But I can't help but think about John 17, beginning with about verse 14, down through verse 21. We learn certain facts about what Jesus said 
One of those is in verse 14 when he says, I have given them thy word. And as a result, Jesus says that the world had hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Now watch this. Thy word is truth. Now Jesus spoke unto the apostles the words of the Father. The apostles received that word and they were sanctified by it. Now watch this. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Dearly beloved, if the apostles were not articulating the mind of God on the day of Pentecost, then neither did Jesus when he taught them. Now, no one denies that there came a falling away. As a matter of fact, the apostles prophesied that would happen. For instance, the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, points it out very clearly, says it in explicit language. But Hughes even gets that wrong. Because it was not culture that caused the falling away. It was doctrinal error. Doctrinal error. We know, for instance, that it is uh, corruption in the leadership. Error regarding the person of Christ. These are the things. But however, what Hughes is really talking about is that movement that began in the 19th century on the American frontier. How sad it is that anyone would accept an invitation to write a book describing the churches of Christ as a sect that began in the 19th century on the American frontier and it grew into the fourth largest denomination in the country. But Hughes has to take that position in order to get the appointment for writing the book and in order to please the position prominent poobahs of the prestigious Prager products. In the first chapter of the book, Hughes tells us if one wants to get a peek at the history of this tradition, there's that term again, one can begin with the factors that help explain the division between Church of Christ and the disciples of Christ. One of those factors was that at first a plea for the restoration of primitive Christianity provided a solid foundation. But it soon became apparent that that was viewed in different ways. Now listen. Therefore, it became obvious that primitive Christianity would not provide an adequate basis for unity. Say it however one will. That implies that the New Testament is not an adequate basis for unity. That inadequacy must be obvious to the author, too, for he doesn't contradict it. So what you end up with is a just as plain as the nose on your face message that here is a man attempting to make a plug for unity and diversity under the guise of writing a history. But 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Acts 19.32 doesn't get it wrong either. When one cried one thing and another cried another, 
The result was confusion, not unity. Did you know that in the cases of Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone, restoring the ancient order of things, was not really the most important thing to them? No. No, Hughes tells us. He supplies the history here. The real issue was how to bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. That's Hughes' the second pointed to factor that resulted in the division. Now, you know, remember, remember now, it's the, the uh, fact that the plea for primitive Christianity, they couldn't agree on that. And so that was the first factor in the division between uh, the, the various ones in the Restoration Movement. And now here's the second. This matter of a view of bringing the kingdom of God on earth. Campbell, he said, had a post-millennial view. By that, on page 6, he means that through the power of religion, science, and education, human beings could transform the world and inaugurate the millennial dawn. I'm not ignorant of the fact that some of the earlier Restoration leaders did have some kind of millennial dawn theories and ideas. But Campbell, for instance, debated evidences with Robert Owen. He debated infant baptism with Walker and McCullough. He debated Catholicism with Bishop Purcell. He debated baptism, Holy Spirit, human creeds with Rice. But I don't recall, maybe some of you do, but I do not recall him debating the position that through science the millennial dawn would be ushered in. And if you just go down a list of the subjects taken from the extensive works of Campbell, and by the way, those are available online. You go down just through a list of, uh, of the titles and the topics and the things that he dealt with, when Hughes makes this claim, in my estimation, he's in a fairyland world of his own making. Alexander Campbell was concerned that the truth set forth in the New Testament was the only basis of, uh, that upon which unity could be achieved. Well, there was a third factor that Hughes points to that brought the division that was the Civil War. Hughes is all over the map, or should we say all over the calendar. Well, it's true that brethren were greatly divided over that issue. Those divisions were not just territorial. There were those in the North who sided with the South. There were those in the South who sided with the North. There were divisions over the issue even within families. My wife had an ancestor where there were two brothers. One of them fought for the North and one of them fought for the South. But here's, here's Hughes' explanation of the things that, that brought about the division that eventually led up to 1906 and the, and the a recognition of the Churches of Christ and the separation between the Lord's Church and uh, the Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church. I guess I'm surprised that the author didn't mention the fact that the elder in Midway, Kentucky, Adam Hibbler, who removed the melodeon from the meeting house, was assisted by his slave, Reuben. But maybe that would have been a difficult point for him to make in so much as some of them at, Mid at Midway supported Pinkerton. Some of them did not, but they all installed a slave owner as an elder. Richard Hughes' problem here is that he majors in minor. Though he does give a little bit of space to it, he almost ignores the real causes for the split. I don't know why he did that. I can't read his mind. 
But were I trying to show the Churches of Christ to be just one of three major denominations arising from the 19th century movement on the American frontier, I would probably have done the same thing. Because if I wrote such a book and dealt with, say, the two real primary reasons for the division, it would probably become quite apparent that the book would never see the light of day, at least not with that publisher. Even worse. I might make the fatal mistake of presenting the truth clearly and precisely enough that someone might be converted to Christ and actually learn the truth about the New Testament church. And we surely couldn't have that in a book in the uh, Prager denominational series. The two actual primary factors causing the division, you know this as well as I do, were the Missionary Society and the Instrument of Music. The American Christian Missionary Society was established in Cincinnati, 1849. And brethren, it was immediately objected to for at least four reasons. First of all, it was money-based. Number two, it was a dangerous slippery slope. Number three, it could lead to an overall ecclesiastical system. We could stop right there and say, those things sound kind of familiar to us. But here's the fourth one, and most important of all, there was no Bible authority for it. Men such as Jacob Kreese Jr. and Tolbert Fanning, David Lipscomb, and Benjamin Franklin led the opposition to it. Now for what it's worth, and maybe some might not think it's worth anything, I'm going to throw this in for free. I truly believe, brethren, that as long as we cling only to the prevailing argument that we can do it, therefore we are going to do it, on the basis of it actually passes the authority question, and we ignore these other three opposing arguments that these brethren used against the American Christian Missionary Society, we're going to find ourselves in the midst of division, turmoil, bickering, and severed fellowship from now until the end of time. I'm mindful of Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Well, the Missionary Society was one of the two primary factors that led to the division. The other primary factor, of course, was instrumental music. Those who cho chose then and who choose now to embrace instrumental music and worship, share the same view of the New Testament. And I've heard this a hundred times, I know, already in this lectureship, probably we'll hear it again before this evening's over. New Testament doesn't say not to. Therefore, we're going to do what we want to do. It's the same old story from since the beginning of time. When Eve stretched forth her hand and partook of the forbidden fruit and gave to Adam and he did eat, and humanity argued, I am directing my own steps rather than submitting to the will of God. And a nonchalant and indifferent approach to the concept of denominationalism as employed by Hughes and the Churches of Christ is that same every man can do that which is right in his own eyes argument, but we reject it. Richard Hughes gets so many things wrong in this book that time would forbid us to talk about all of them. For instance, he claims that brethren virtually expelled from their fellowship those who heeded the new cry that the children's homes were unscriptural. Though some in this audience may have been, and I wasn't there at Midway. But I'll tell you where I was. I was in Liberty Hill, Texas, when this issue of the orphan's home reared its ugly head. And it was the result of a preacher who went from house to house with his little charts, convincing brethren that it was there was no authority 
for the congregation to uh, support the children's home that they were uh, supporting at that particular time. And what happened? When the elders became aware of it, they fired the man. But instead of him leaving town, what he did was took about half of the members with him and began meeting in the schoolhouse. Now you tell me who expelled who. Who made the issue one an issue of fellowship? If we're going to talk about history, let's get it right. Received an email from Brother Darrell Debo in Burnett, Texas, which is close to Liberty Hill. Uh, this old preacher died the other day, one day last week at the age of 88. Having never repented, having never come to a knowledge of the truth on this matter and continued to cause uh, trouble about it until the day that he died. I don't know if Richard Hughes sees things like the uh, struggle over the orphan's home issue as just a bump in the road from sectarian status to denominational status, or if he doesn't realize it goes against what he's trying to produce here. But the fact of the matter is that it was a hindrance to what he's trying to, to get across. Now, this man has a special place in his heart for some brethren, like Foy Walt Jr. But that's not a special place that Brother Wallace would appreciate. Richard Hughes considered Brother Wallace as mean. Or well, maybe that's not too unusual. Some brethren who appreciated what Brother Wallace said thought he was mean too. I heard a story one time that uh, Brother Wallace, especially long in his preaching one evening, which of course was not unusual, he was preaching and one brother got up and started to leave. Brother Wallace called out to him, Where are you going? And the brother said, well, I'm going to get a haircut. Which Brother Wallace responded, you should have done that before you came. And he said, I did. <laughs> but did you know, brethren, Foy E. Wallace contributed very little of any substance to the premillennialism debate? We said. I know that all of you preachers here and maybe some of the rest of you have read and studied God's prophetic word by Brother Wallace. Anyone who would tell you that Brother Wallace contributed nothing of substance to that debate knowing of the existence of that book I, I don't know what to think about it. It's amazing to me. But here's the real thing, I believe, from having read this book, yes, I, I read it, and I heard about the, uh, the problems uh, some tried to raise last year, the allegations some didn't read the book. I didn't read it as many times as some of you read yours. I couldn't stomach it that much, but I read it. And based on what he says there, I'm going to make a conjecture here. That Brother Wallace was Hughes' whipping boy for the attack on book, chapter, and verse authoritative preaching that one used to hear in all the pulpits of the Church of Christ. Back in the early and mid middle decades of the 20th century. Sermons pointing out at the errors in denominationalism, Hughes tells us, would no longer be tolerated if the church was to contend successfully on a national scale. Thus, Hughes writes, by the late 1970s, one hardly heard from the pulpits of congregations the traditional distinctiveness that defined churches of Christ for 150 years. 
Sounds like a contention for numbers, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you something. We were preaching the same thing the apostle preached. And if I do my math right, that's a lot longer than 150 years. Hugh's claim may be right in fact of the matter, and that in that time frame in regions across the country, the preaching of book, chapter, and verse had been rejected, and, and later on it did in fact become pretty much a, a widespread thing. If that were not the case, he would not continually refer to the church as a product of a movement. That is, if he didn't think it was a good thing that book, chapter, and verse preaching was no longer done. He has to believe that's a good thing because otherwise it puts a barrier against this evolution of the church from a sect to a denomination. It never was the one and it never has been and never will be the other. So Hughes, now he has to raise the issue, as men often do in these kinds of books. The problem with logic. You know, we're just followers of bacon and lock. We're not really those who have a heart that's in tune with uh, preaching that which is, is good for people. All, all we have is this head mindset that preaches a message that divides people. Now let's go back to what Jesus said. His word unites. Well, let's skip it just a little bit here. Hughes continues his farcical march toward the evolution of a full-fledged denomination from sectarian status. And what is one of those steps? Church buildings. Church buildings. They were symbols of modernization among us. After all, we were beginning to, to right our wrongs left over from slavery, he says. We showed how in tune we were with Martin Luther King Jr. when Royce Money went to Terrell, Texas and apologized to African members of the Churches of Christ for years of racial discrimination. Don't apologize for me. I've never been a racist. And anyone before me, you can't apologize for them either. But that's not the point, is it? The point is that Hughes is trying to show how we need to become a group of people who are culture-oriented, we're progressive, we're politically correct, and all of those kinds of things. Hang the truth, that doesn't really matter. So I guess we owe a great debt to ACU for the right to feel comfortable about all these massive modern buildings so that we can make a giant stride that would take us to the point of at least looking like the denominations. Well, if we want to do that, why don't we put a casino down in the basement in an open-air restaurant on the roof? Then we can really look politically correct and and culturally hip. Well, the preaching was the problem for Hughes. But he had some opposition. Brother Ira Rice. Remember, we owe Brother Rice a great deal. He, as much, if not more than any bond, saw what was coming. And he warned the brethren about this preaching of Bart and Bonhoeffer rather than book, chapter, and verse preaching. Hugh says, brother, I suspicioned it was a problem. No, he didn't. He knew it was. And so Ira, in his outcry and contending for the faith, Hugh says, you know, that wasn't sufficient to cause one to imagine that Paul Pitts and Church of Christ in the 1960s and 70s was theologically illiterate? Oh, no. No. It really only benefited and showed how this tradition benefited from the schools, the graduate schools, 
theological training, all aboard the seminary tra train. How could the church survive then? Change. Change. And what change would be the one that was most crucial? If the church is really to change, if it's going to be this denomination that these men sought for it to be, there had to be a change. And Hughes mentions this in his last chapter called Renewal. The change that is important and shows where we're going is how we view the, view the Bible. We know how liberals view the Bible. As someone said last night, I believe it was, they don't view it as the verbal, plenary, inspired word of God. They view it as a book that they can change to fit whatever they want it to fit and however they want it to fit. As an example of this, Hughes says, you know, if you look at the Bible as a legal document, there's a problem in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 1 Timothy 2, 12, in terms of the woman's role. But if we just view the Bible as a theological book, then we can look at Galatians 3, 28, and that'll trump 1 Corinthians 4, 34, and 1 Timothy 2. We don't have to... Uh, take the scriptures on what they say, but rather we can use some other scripture to show that those original scriptures are not as important. Well, we have a lot more that we could say. But let's just close with this thought. How sad it is that these kind of men are teaching our young people. And Let's also recognize the fact that there's more to it than just saying, you know, it'd be nice if these people would come back to the truth. I want, I want you to think about James 5.19. James says, if one of you err from the truth and one, what? Convert him. These people don't just need to be restored. They need to be reconverted. They need to understand that the Bible is the word of God, the blueprint for the church. It is the pattern that we must follow. And the church of our Lord is not a denomination. It is not the result of a movement on the American frontier. Thank you very much. Very fine material. We appreciate it very much. I was thinking, and I think uh, probably Brother Dubbs, the only one, and maybe Terry. Uh, you remember back uh, what made the old Freed Hardeman lectures so important in about 1970? It was this kind of preaching. People flock from everywhere to hear that preaching. But that's 40 years, 41 years ago now. A lot of folks are dead now. But they will swell that thing up, and the truth of the matter is, it's because of what they succeeded in there when they would deal with matters like this that caused Brother Warren uh, to start the Spiritual Sword Lectures and laid the groundwork for many other lectures because they saw what good was being done. But those same places don't do that anymore. I, I've heard people stand in the pulpit uh, lecturing over there in Fleet Hardeman and deal with books just like this. And you, you find it done today. You know, they've changed. And I dare say these folks don't believe in objective, absolute human and attainable truth. They believe too much in change. You, you can't change truth. You can't change a fact. You can't change any of those things. I was thinking, too, of Brother G.K. Wallace. Some of you may know this, the close cousin of Brother Foy. I've been in the... Uh, church up there where they had the instruments first moved into it and I've seen the little instruments some of you may have too <laughs> brother Wallace said he was on a tour up there and of course the disciples of Christ control all of that and when the disciples of Christ cheerleader showed them the instrument uh, he had to make a little uh, gallery and you might remember the church there he said now isn't this such a little thing to divide the church over 
Well, he probably wished Brother Wallace was in the crowd. Because Brother Wallace spoke up and said, it's as big as the golden calf. <laughs> and that's exactly right. That's it. They, they loved that thing to that point. And thus they were willing to have that thing to the vision of the church, regardless of what the Bible says, one way or the other. And that's what's wrong with a great many of these people. Anybody that would say that Hoy Wallace Jr. was not the one in the leadership capacity to help stop the premillennialists throughout the 30s, even to the 40s, I, I just don't have much trust in any of their estimate of anything. Anybody that knows what those guys did at that time. And Brother Wallace was under a great deal of fire for doing a lot of what he did. But he did it anyway. And that's the way we've got to be. Those fellows at that time that we think of, those of us who still love the truth and what the church is all about in the Bible, if those fellows were today preaching as we are, they wouldn't be any more respected than what we are today by these other folks. Yes, sir. Well, it's just like the, what's going on in the nation or in American history. It's revisionist history. And that's what's going on. And people just won't believe that somebody like that would change everything. But remember, they are agents of change, and they want you to know they're agents of change. And you need to be an agent of change. We don't need to stay static with anything. And thus, that's the way they function. Wow. Isn't it amazing? They tell you what they are. They're out there teaching you should be what they are. And somebody says, I just can't believe a man like that would be that way. Well, then, for probably the reason you don't believe the Bible either. Thank you very much. It's time for us to go eat a bite. And uh, we'll be led in prayer. And, Brother Buddy, would you do that for us? And also give thanks for the food. Let's be standing, please. <laughs>